And Lou, Lou, I just want to ask you about, you, you wrote two of the stories. So how, how did you come to write for the second second box set? Who asked you to do that? And did you ask? Um, David again. No, David. And the ever patient uh, Matt Fitton uh, uh, overseeing what I was doing. Um, I love titles. I know you said you don't look at the titles, but he he came up with um, the Phantom Pregnancy title, which I thought was a stroke of genius, which I'm very happy to take credit for, but I have to give it to Matt, really. Um, I'm assuming that Let the Angels Tell Thee was your title, though. That's very yes. Shakespearean. That's That was just you. Yes, that was just <laughs> that was just me. I wanted Anne to have a love life. I think that was um, my starting point for that one. And the second one was... Um, the illegal so-called illegals coming into our country for which I have you know enormous sympathy and empathy and feel I should be doing a lot more to protect and help them that that inspired that story um yeah. I mean once again it's all I, I love your writing because I, I can always feel you through it so that you know the advantage of knowing you a bit is that your your passions, your interests come through? Um, so as I said, the first one in terms of let the angel tell you. Um, once again, an older woman, sexuality, romance. Well, actually, what was it? Yeah, it's more than romance. Actually, it really is passion. Um, bit of lust thrown in. Um, so what 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 made you decide to actually take a, a topic that, on the whole, most people will avoid? That's such an interesting question. I. I think specifically for that reason, because most people do avoid it. It needs, I mean, this, this, um, I think, um, vulnerability is strength. It sounds like an oxymoron or a contradiction or a dichotomy, but it's actually the more vulnerable you are, the stronger you become and the more you can influence and the more you can give people, um, confidence and courage uh, if they see themselves reflected. And the bulk of our audience are women of a certain age. I mean, that's true of audio, that's true of soap, that's true of theatre. And we don't see ourselves reflected nearly enough. But we can't just sit there and can complain about that because you can't expect a 22-year-old um male to write about the menopause. Why would he be interested? Why would he without, you know, asking his mother a whole load of embarrassing questions. How is he ever going to know the other? You've got to have someone who's been through it to be able to, uh, I mean, I, I, I pluck menopause out just because it's so, you know, quintessentially female, obviously. But it's, you know, there are those subjects which are considered taboo that just need to be need to be flagged up need to be you know it's all right it's not an illness it's a it's a it's part of life and you know a woman in her 70s still has um you know very strong feelings and emotions and you can't be i hate that phrase stop being such an old woman i mean it's it's mm. considered not much of an insult at all it's like you know We've stopped saying that's so gay because it's offensive. We've stopped using the N word because that's offensive. Nobody's addressed. Ah, oh, don't be such an old woman. Big girl's blouse. These things are very, very offensive. They touch, they hurt. Mm. But I'm you and and they hurt because our voice isn't loud enough. We're not strong enough. The use of the I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going off topic a bit no, here, no. but the, no, the it's use not great. of the C, the C word as the worst insult you can hurl at anyone is quintessentially mm. female. Of course it is. It, it mm. could, you cannot get anything more female, and yet it's the worst instinct, insult you can hurl at anyone. Why is that? It's because we don't have a loud enough voice because there aren't enough women writers. Yeah. I, I think it's it's no it, i think a lot of what lou is saying is exactly why i think um you know diversity of, of, of writers rooms is important and also uh, given what she said also in terms of age it was why when we did uh after girl i was very insistent that it was only female writers not with partially because big finish weren't using enough at the time but also because i thought it would be better for the story so they, you know there was a moment where we were struggling to find um the, the, the fourth writer which eventually became victoria saxton 
um, mm -hmm. who, who weirdly came up in conversation the weekend because she's now engaged to Maggie Service's uh, brother, who I mentioned earlier. So it's all slightly weird within oh, um... strange worlds. Was. Um, but there was a point where I was struggling to find a fourth writer and, and, and things that Helen was, was saying, well, maybe, John, do you want to do one? Going, I'm going, absolutely not. And I felt very much, from a script editing perspective, when I worked on those, um, I could, there were two specific instances uh, that I felt really, really rammed at home in my head. One of, my, one of them really small, one of them big. One of the, the big one was the entire plot of Helen's episode and the end of Helen's episode, which I just thought, I, I do, do not believe any man would probably have gone to that place and pushed it into that place that it goes. I think it, it, it because it's written by a woman, it, it, it written by a woman, it is um, more daring than I think any man would have gone. It's an and extraordinary the other one is, script. It's, it's a, a it, yeah. wonderful script. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Go on. Absolutely nailed that one. And it was amazing. The other one, and this this is so small in comparison. Is there was just one line when one of the characters, I think it was, I think I, I think her name was Claire, but I can't remember her surname. Um, said at one point, oh, "I'm just going to go and have a pee or a piss or something like that." And I kind of think again, I suspect a man wouldn't have done that. Uh, and then that occasional, yeah, the thinking, and it, and it's hope in a weird way it sort of changed how I wanted to approach writing women, and but also really justified those decisions and was re really reminding me. Of um, of why the diversity in in a, in a writer's room is is really important because there there will always be things. Because you know, Lou writes a story for survivors, which I am so uncomfortable in, but it's such a good story because I'm so uncomfortable. Which is just the I think it's the three I think it's the four leads, four female leads, and they're having conversations about things that I don't ever want to hear women have conversations about, and going off and having wheeze behind things, and it's it was interesting because as I. I Listening to it, I was thinking, this is something that men would never write. But yet, yeah. Lou has a freedom to write it, and it actually opens up men's eyes in, in a way that women have conversations that we would never normally hear. And so I felt like I was taken into a world that I'm not privileged to hear, because, you know, I didn't realise that women farted and women did things like that, because that's not, that's not what <laughs> women do in public. Uh, but yeah. Lou is just willing to open up the whole world and say, hey, have a look at this. Nick, Nick Briggs said to me that I'd put that weeing scene in on purpose because I always complain to him that he can get very lavatorial very early on in any discussion. <laughs> whenever, you know, whenever we're in the studio, the first toilet reference, I'm going, oh, it's only 20 past 10. You know, it's just like an ongoing gag, really. And he said that I wrote that scene specifically to, <laughs> to tease him. I think I probably did, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because it's a, in, so in that first story you wrote, um, you really put Adam through the, the mental ringer um, more so than other people do. In terms of, was it just a fun t time to get you know time to get John in terms of this? How how much can we put Adam through the mental ringer and really make life hard for him? I think you did ring me up after you read it and said yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of honey and lemon needed. Yeah, I think that was a lot <laughs> keep of the local course I mean, working. It, it's sort of my standard joke is is that that um, when I get the script, I got to go. How much am I going to spit all over this? Because uh, the, the, all of them were just absolutely covered in spittle, and and we're doing the, the one this year. I was going to go uh, this year. What I'm going to be doing mainly is gobbing over my iPad. That's that's oh, what I mean. <laughs> <God. quite> the... <laughs> Bring in the sanitizers. No, it was yeah, uh, it was it was fun, and I I often. When I get a Leela script, for example, and she does nothing but run and scream, um, it, it's slightly disappointing. I always like there to be some deep character moving kind of relationship thing going on as well. But of course, basically, they're adventure stories, aren't they? You've got to mm. take whatever you do has to serve your story. And I'm afraid to put John through the ringer to serve the story, but. <laughs> Thing. it's not actually it's not a, a thing to apologize for really because it is you, that you as from an active perspective you want to be doing stuff um mm -hmm. and it, from from even on the most minor level i've always found that the days when i've got a bigger part just go more quickly because you're mm -hmm. you know rather than the sitting outside in the green room where it's nice enough having a chat with people but you're going like I, I could you know I, I could be loitering around wasting time anywhere whereas the bit i want to be doing is i want to be in studio doing the performance and when you're kind of in that zone it just is is more absorbing to me personally and um and and then then there's also the aspect of challenge and that um what 
you were saying earlier about Lou's as Anne being quite different from Lou. That uh, I, I remember to see. I, I was casting in an, another eight born years ago, which was called Seasons Greetings, and the part I was casting. Uh, Neville was the only one where I looked through there's about four or five male parts and I thought I kind of know how to play all the other four I'm not sure how to pitch this one which was a good reason to do it and so that's the thing you're always kind of wanting these things to go well what will be tricky to do because I kind of want to push myself and like find the extremes and see where I can go and certainly from a writing man I've been writing for Lou it's always that thing where you're going okay you've got a really good actor here give them material to work with um, so yeah I'm kind of you know very much on board with being put through the ringer whenever it's interesting, isn't it, that to step outside your comfort zone is often the place where you produce your best work. Mm. When you get a part yeah. that you can do standing on your head, not that, yeah, I mean, I'm being flip, but, no, but some yeah, parts yeah, are yeah, easier yeah. than others. It's interesting. There are that... it's easy. Yeah, there are somewhere it's easy to lean into tricks you've got. Yes. Uh, and, 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 um, and, 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 take the easier options and and i think yeah the majority of the time it's going i want to find something different to explore rather than yeah. just do easy route i mean and, and i mean sometimes you know the easy route is perfectly acceptable um but um yeah a, a, a degree of challenge and, and kind of looking for your limits is is where things can happen that daring and exciting mm. lou, lou i know you have a major passion for shakespeare and um i'm just wondering how much you feel you channel Shakespeare in terms of some of your writing, in terms of you, you use horror and tragedy in a way that Shakespeare often does in terms of what he does with his characters and, and that, but you also manage to be so poetic. So a lot of your dialogue and the scenes, are, there's a beauty and creativity in your horror. Is that something that just, it's just how you write? Do you think, are you trying to channel some of your Shakespearean background or is it just because Shakespeare's just part of who you are that comes out? I think that's probably the, loveliest compliment I've ever had about my writing. So mm. thank you for that. I think probably 50 years, literally 50 plus years of speaking other people's lines, you learn yeah. what feels luscious in the mouth and what can, what can create the best atmosphere. So uh, yes. And I think, Probably my writing might be considered a bit old fashioned now, but I I I think it probably is a bit heightened because of the amount of classical work that I've done. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure it'd be old fashioned because topically what you're discussing is never old fashioned because you deal as we just discussed, you're dealing with topics that are very real, very now for people. But as I said you just do it in a way which has a poetry to it. Just, you know, just Arthur curious. Miller, you know, writes all wrote all his plays in verse before he contemporized them. Right. Which is why they have this epic Greek tragedy feel to them. I I would love to see those scripts, to see how they are. Mm. But I think that so his 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 writing has that uh that 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 literation quality to it that is it's almost it's like it touches the divine somehow i think um and that and maybe that's because he sees these ordinary stories death of a salesman you know this ordinary story in this huge greek tragedy family drama dramatic way i i want to do i had this idea the other day Maybe I shouldn't air it. Someone will nab it. But I'd like to take a play like Look Back in Anger, you know, a domestic drama, and rewrite it using only Shakespearean quotes. So you take the yeah. canon and find a, well, you know, it's such, it's so yeah. vast, yep, something yep. for everything, and find the, the find the dialogue that would work. So, so. Yes, you'd have you'd combine Osborne and and Shakespeare and see what see what materializes. I think it would be really interesting. Exercise. AI could probably do that for you now if you actually asked an AI. You know, only Shakespeare, <laughs> using only Shakespearean quotes. Rewrite this play. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, your second play was Phantom Pregnancy, which you've given away the credit to the title. Um, yeah. Now, once again, it, as it deals with refugees, corruption, and the breaking of trust, um, as a, these are all passions of yours as a person. Um, how, how do you find being able to write in terms of being able to express what you are concerned about as a person? And where, where do you draw the line in terms of how much you should put on the page? I'm not sure a line should be drawn. Um, and I write better when it's collaborative. I'm not so good on my own. So, as I say, Matt Fitton was a fantastic guide for me. Um, and they were some of my earlier scripts, so I really did need a hand to hold. And he he held it very firmly and helped me enormously. Um Yes, I, I, I don't think you can write with censorship in mind. I think you just need to. Well, you, John, you call it the vomit draft, don't you? Oh, I mean, not particularly, but I'm aware of that as a thing. So, yeah, kind of like, like the, 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 the just um, pushing through it, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you just. Well, bleh. Yeah, it's always the thing that um, I always kind of suggest to anyone trying writing. You've got to remember that you know you've never seen anybody. You're not seeing anybody else's first draft in like a finished. TV program or a script or anything you, or any book you're reading. It's not their first draft, so don't compare yours to that. Uh, so whatever, I'm, I'm always happy to kind of encourage whatever your process is, but just never think, never look at your first thing and go, oh, God, this is crap in comparison to the book. Yeah, because you've not edited it yet. Everybody else needs an editor. Everybody else needs people to kind of say, look at that bit. That bit's a bit shit. It, you know, everyone. And and sometimes people get so powerful they don't have them, and we've always been aware of those well, massive, self-indulgent, awful things that people have written when when nobody is really willing to or powerful enough to say, have you thought that maybe not that bit, you know? Um, so yeah, kind of collaboration is always a really useful thing to have. With that script, the line I had, or the two lines I had was there's an illegal immigrant from someone. And then Anne responds, some people would call them refugees. Mm. And that was a kind of springboard for me, for the whole story. And very flatteringly that was the line that was actually picked up on twitter when it came out and mm. somebody thanked me for saying the line um but deep down i was thanking myself for writing it <laughs> also I, I think specifically in terms of the omega factor we've also got to do a, a bit of a shout out here to to, to natasha who we've mentioned several times before because natasha is the rights holder and is effectively the control of these things. And and it does mean that in contrast to other things we work on, uh, where we've got to be aware of what the license is like, I think the Omega Factor, more than almost any other big finished series, is one where you can pretty much say anything. Um, and and it can have a bit more of a political stance. It, uh, and, and we're in the fortunate position that, that, that Tasha is, you know, somebody I think we're all relatively politically aligned with. Um, and but so we can address some of these things in a way that we you can't necessarily do so much in say Doctor Who or Doctor Who spin offs. Yeah, or that happened like, to me. That's yeah. true, isn't it? That hadn't occurred yeah, to I've me. Always, I've, I've really me. noticed this with with the one that's coming out this year. We're having these, all these things that you know directly addressing subjects. We kind of go, yep, yep. This is. I'm, I'm glad we can say this. So yeah. <laughs> If you enjoyed what you heard in this clip from the Sirens of Audio podcast, be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell so you never miss out on another episode from us. And if you want to find out more about us, including our back catalogue of episodes, you can head over to sirensofaudio.com.